Do you want to understand how your machine learning models work? How each model feature has contributed to a prediction? Or even what trends the model is using to make predictions in general? Well, then look no further than SHAP. It is the most powerful Python package for understanding and debugging your models. Today, we'll be walking through SHAP code as well as explanations for all of the SHAP plots. These include the waterfall plot, force plots, absolute mean SHAP plot, B-swarm plot, and dependence plot. You will see how, with a few lines of code, we're able to create eye-catching and insightful visualizations. If you want this code, then check out the companion article linked in the description. We don't discuss it in this video, but there's also a section in the article that looks at interpreting SHAP values when you have a binary target variable. Really, the plots that we see in this video are just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to get your SHAP skills in ship shape, then wait until the end of the video where I explain how you can get access to a Python course. For now, let's jump to the tutorial notebook. We start by importing all the necessary Python packages. We have some standard packages like pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and seaborn. We'll be using xgboost to build our model. And finally, we import the shap package. We also have to initialize this package. This just allows us to just to display some of the SHAP plots in the notebook. Next, we're going to load our data set. And we'll be using a abalone data set. And you can see that if we print out the length, we have 4,177 observations, or abalone, in this data set. So abalones are a type of shellfish delicacy. And we want to use this data set to try to predict their age, or more specifically, the number of rings in the abalone shell. We'll be using features like the length of the shell, the diameter of the shell, as well as the whole weight of the abalone. If you want more details on the fields, then just check out the link to the, the data set at the top of this notebook. Now, before we jump to the SHAP values, it's worth exploring this data set. This is to build some intuition. It can also help you understand what you see in the SHAP plots. So we start by looking at one of the features and we display a scatter plot of whole weights and rings. Whole weight is the weight of the entire abalone and this includes the shell and the meat inside the shell. So looking at the scatter plot, we can see that the number of rings tends to increase as whole weight increases. This makes sense as we would expect older abalone to be larger and way more. We can also visualize the sex of the abalone. This is a categorical feature when abalone can either be labeled as infant, I, male, M, and female, F. For each of these labels, we create a box plot of the number of rings. So looking at this box plot, we can see that infants tend to have a lower number of rings. And when we compare males and females, there's really not that much difference. I wanted to point this feature out as the SHAP values for categorical features can get a little weird. After one hot encoding, all the individual binary features will have their own SHAP values. This makes it difficult to understand the overall contribution of the original categorical feature. We won't go into details here, but there's a useful article linked in the description. For our last bit of data exploration, we're going to create a correlation matrix for all the continuous features in our data sets. We then visualize this using a heat map. So you can see that we're dealing with some highly correlated features. For example, length and diameter are perfectly correlated. Whole weight is also highly correlated with some of the other weight measurements. For example, shucked weight, which is the weight of the meat inside of the abalone shell, and shell weight, which is the weight of just the shell excluding the meat. Now, we're almost ready to build our model. We're going to use our data exploration to help inform some feature engineering. So the first thing we're going to do is drop diameter and whole weight from our list of features. 
This is just because we saw that these were highly correlated with some of the other features. We also saw that sex was a categorical feature. So before we can use it in a model, we need to transform it into three dummy variables. We then drop the original feature from the data set. So we just uh, display a snapshot of our X feature matrix. And you can see that we have eight model features in total. We can now train a model to predict the number of rings in an abalone shell. As our target variable is continuous, we're going to be using the xgboost regressor function. And we train a model on the entire feature set. At this point, our model should be good enough to demonstrate the SHAP package. We can see this by evaluating it. First, we get the predictions on the entire training set, and we create a scatter plot of these predictions versus the actual number of rings. We also add a red line, which gives the perfect predictions. So we can see the model is doing an all right job. The predictions are not too far away from the red line. So we haven't put too much effort into this model. And unless you're using SHAP for data exploration, you should always use best practices. For example, using a train test split. The better your model, the more reliable your SHAP analysis will be. So that evaluation told us how well the model was making predictions. We can now use SHAP to tell us how it is making those predictions. To do this, we pass our model into the SHAP explainer function. This creates an explainer object. We then use this to calculate SHAP values for every observation in the feature matrix. And that's it, it's as simple as that. With a few lines of code, you can calculate the SHAP values and gain an incredible insight into how your model is working. Just one note, this step can take a long time to run. If your feature matrix is large, you can save time by only passing a subset of observations. For example, if we use this line instead, it would return the SHAP values for the first 100 observations. We won't go into detail in this SHAP value object, but for now, we're just gonna look at the shape of its values component. So this tells us that there are eight SHAP values for each of the 4,177 observations. Remember, we had eight module, model features. So in other words, we have one SHAP value for each feature in our model. So we can use the SHAP waterfall function to visualize these SHAP values. And yeah, we display the waterfall plot for the first observation. So there's a lot going on. Yeah, so let's, let's break down what each of these figures mean. Firstly, uh, E of f of x is the average predicted number of rings across all 4,177 abalone. f of x is the predicted number of rings for this particular abalone. The SHAP values are all these values in between. They tell us how each module feature has contributed to the difference between the prediction and the average prediction. So for example, shucked weight has increased the predicted number of rings by 1.68. And lastly, all these numbers on the left are the actual feature values. So for example, we can see that this feature is male because sex.m equals one. Another way to visualize this information is to use the force plot. You can think of this as a condensed waterfall plot. So you can see that we have the same base value as before, and you can see how each feature has contributed to the final prediction of 13.04. So the waterfall plot and force plot are useful for understanding how the model has made individual predictions. Now, let's see how we can understand the trends the model is using to make predictions in general. We can also combine multiple force plots together to create a stacked force plot. 
Here we have passed the first 100 observations to the force plot function. How this works is that each of the individual force plots has been flipped 90 degrees. And then we stack them side by side vertically. And you can see that this plot is interactive. We can choose which features to use to order the force plot by. So for example, let's click shell weight. We can also choose which shack values we want to display. So again, let's click shell weight. And from this plot, we can see that as shell weight increases, the shack values also increase. So in other words, older abalone tend to have heavier shells. So the force plots are useful if you want to quickly explore some of the relationships captured by the model. The next plot we'll look at can tell us which features are most important to the model. The next built-in function is the, the bar function. And this gives us the absolute mean shaft plot. So each of these bars gives the absolute mean shaft value for that feature. Remember, for each observation, there will be a shaft value for each of the eight model features. We have taken the absolute of these values and calculated the average across all 4,177 observations. We take the absolute as we do not want positive and negative shaft values to offset each other. So features that have made large positive or negative contributions will have a large mean shaft value. So in other words, these are the features that have made a significant contribution to the model's predictions. In this sense, the mean shaft plot can be sort of used as a metric for feature importance. So next, in my opinion, we have the single most useful shaft plot, and that's the bee swarm plot. So this is a visualization of all of the shaft values. And on the y-axis, we have the values grouped by the different features, and the color of the points are determined by the feature values. So higher values are redder. And then on the x-axis, we have the shaft values. So like with mean shap, the B swarm can be used to highlight important relationships. We can see which features have large positive or large negative shaft values. In fact, these features have been ordered um, in the same order as the mean shaft plot. We can also use this plot to start to understand the nature of these relationships. For shell weights, notice that as the feature values increase, the shaft values also increase. We saw a similar relationship in the stacked force plot. You may also notice that the relationship for shaft weight is, is the opposite. Um, looking at the bee swarm plot, you can see that large values for this feature are associated with smaller shaft values. Let's use dependence plots to try to understand what's going on here. So a dependence plot is just a scatter plot of the shaft values versus the feature values for a single feature. And they are particularly useful if the feature has a non-linear relationship with the target variable. So for example, we have the dependence plot for shell weight. And looking at the bee swarm plot, we might have assumed that this relationship was linear. But looking at the dependence plot, we can see that it's not exactly or not perfectly linear. We can also use the values for a second feature to color the scatter plot. So we have the same plot as before, but now the larger the shaft weight value, the redder the point. And the shaft values are large when both shell weight and shaft weight are large. And finally, we also have the dependence plot for shaft weight. And we can use this plot to confirm what we saw in the bee swarm plots. The shaft values do decrease as the shaft weight increases. Intuitively, this relationship seems strange. 
Wouldn't we expect all the abalone to be larger and have more meat? Well, this is in fact a result of an interaction between shell weight and shuck weight. We can actually use SHAP interaction values to identify relationships like these. This is an extension of standard SHAP values. If you want to learn more, you can get free access to my Python SHAP course by signing up to the newsletter in the description. Along with SHAP interaction values, you'll learn all the theory behind SHAP, as well as how to build your own custom SHAP plots. There is even a lesson on working with image data and a deep learning model.